Thank you for joining this Biden for President event. We'd like to thank our guests, Governor Gretchen Whitmer of Michigan, Governor Phil Murphy of New Jersey, and Governor Ned Lamont of Connecticut. Now, please welcome Vice President Joe Biden. Hey, thank you all for joining me today. And I don't want to take too much time here at the top because I want people to hear directly from you guys. Uh, you're living it every day. You're making the really tough decisions on the ground every day. You've been doing it from day one. And uh, there are a lot of, as you know better than I do, a lot of scared people in this country, all across the country, who are looking for leadership and clear guidance. And so often it's all of you that, are, that they're looking to. It's, this is not a partisan statement. Governors, mayors, local leaders, are, you're all stepping up all across the country, Republicans and Democrats alike, uh, filling the vacuum of leadership that I believe the federal government should uh, be having your backs and hasn't done it enough. And uh, it, should be, uh, it should be fighting like hell to get your states, the PPE and the, and the test and, uh, and the funding that you so desperately need to keep your economies going. And this is not a moment for excuses or deflections or blame game. We're, 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 it's a, we're in the middle of a pandemic that had cost us more than 85,000 jobs as of today. Lives of millions of people, millions of people, millions of jobs. You know, and we're in a position where, you know, we just got new unemployment insurance this morning, uh, n numbers. 36.5 million claims since this crisis began and almost 3 million new claims in the last week. The unemployment rate is nearing 15%, the highest it's been since the Great Depression. But I need not tell you all that. Of course, it's, uh, it's the least well-off for being hit the hardest. 40% of the households making $40,000 or less experienced a job loss just in March. And we're going to have to work harder and smarter than ever before to pull ourselves out of this economic tailspin. But I know what all of you know, that the only way out of this is by following the science, listening to the experts, talking and taking responsible precautions that are going to help us reopen the economy as safely and as quickly as possible. And uh, as, as we do, there's got to be federal support to state and local levels of our government, in my view, so that we'll be able to come out of this crisis stronger and more united. We have an opportunity, in my view, to transform the economy as we come out, to build a more inclusive and more resilient middle class. And I think that can withstand uh, the next, next public crisis, whatever it is, however it comes about. Not just reward the people who are well off and well connected. It's time for us to make sure everyone gets a fair shot of success in this country. We've got, and I know you all stand for that. We've got a lot of ground to cover. So let's start with this. You know that virus can hit anyone, anywhere. but it doesn't affect every community the same. It hits the most vulnerable, the least resourced, and the hardest. And Governor Whitmer, I know that you've created a Michigan uh, Coronavirus Task Force on racial disparities to address the disproportionate impact the virus is having on communities of color. What have we learned? What have, what, what have we learned? Is I, I found it both stunning and heartbreaking. Black populations have the coronavirus infections at three times rate higher than many white counties. Death rates are nearly six times as high. But I really applaud your leadership in this issue because I can tell you, I, you know, what, what are you focusing on? What, can you tell a little bit about the work your task force is doing and what you found both in terms of the scope of the challenge and the potential ways to address it, because it's not just in Michigan. Sure, I'm happy to thank you much, Mr. Vice President. I'm glad to be here with Governor Murphy and Lamont. This is one of the great um, things that I have found in the midst of this crisis is that I've been able to reach out and get counsel. My fellow partners were gathered to try to address the issues that were running in our states across this country and tell the story about what's happening here in Michigan. Now, this week, I lost another dear friend of mine to COVID-19. He was on a ventilator for weeks on end. He was a champion on behalf of the people of Detroit and the legislature, and he passed away two days ago, and it's heartbreaking. Michigan has been one of the hardest-hit states in the fight against COVID-19. 
but when aggressively fighting. My and I have been working around the clock to do a number of things, make sure people have support they need. We've banned evictions and closures so people can stay in their homes. We've expanded unemployment benefits to help working people put food on the table when they're out of and we've expanded access to child care for our frontline workers. And we're still working hard to Michigander's spread of this virus and very real threat of what could be a second wave that would dwarf the experience we've had thus far. We want this sacrifice we've made to have been made in vain. And that's why we've got to be really smart. We've ramped up our testing abilities, working with a number of businesses like CVS and Walgreens and Rite Aid to launch drive through testing sites across the state. We've worked with nearly all of the state's health insurance companies to waive cost sharing and including co-pays, deductibles, and co-insurance for COVID-19 testing and treatment. And we're testing more and more people every single day. And a percentage, our percentage of positive cases has gone down. This past Sunday, we were at just 6% positive cases, which is the lowest percent we've had since the onset of those first cases, March 10th. The day after you were here in Michigan with me was the first day we got our, our two cases, and this is the lowest we've been since that, almost six weeks ago. We've still got a lot of work to do, though, and there's no question that we need help from the federal government. The issue around racial disparities is one that we have seen play out, and Michigan was one of the first states to release data around uh, people's race. Uh, we've seen it in Illinois and Louisiana, but here in Michigan, 14% of our population is African American, and yet over 40% of our COVID-19 deaths are African Americans here in Michigan. And the virus is just simply holding up a mirror to our country, to the disparate you know, outcomes for people of color in America generally, and reminding us about these deep inequities. From the basic lack of access to healthcare, to the access to transportation, to lack of protections in the workplace, to the fact that a front, our front line, you know, the people that are our essential workforce is often disproportionately people of color. These inequities hit people of color and the vulnerable communities the hardest. So that's why we created this task force around racial disparities. It's chaired by my Lieutenant Governor Garland Gilchrist, who's the first African-American Lieutenant Governor in Michigan history. And they're gonna provide recommendations on how to address racial disparities in this moment but also a plan for going forward. We've been focused on attacking implicit bias and expanding healthcare, but we know that there's a lot more to learn in this moment. And that's why we're gonna continue to see this through, not just through the other side of COVID-19, but to inform a policy agenda that really creates equitable outcomes and equitable opportunity for people. We've also created something called the Frontlines um, Futures for Front which is kind of like the GI Bill, is to give an opportunity to people who've been on the front lines if they want to add to school and some additional skills. We want to make sure that they know how grateful we are that they kept stock in the shelves in the grocery store or showing up um, when, when we're in trouble, whether it's at the hospital or in an emergency. And we need to do right by the people that have made such sacrifice on all of our behalf. It's been a tough eight weeks, but we are seeing that that we're making a difference. All of these aggressive actions are, are starting to pay off, but we are nowhere out of the woods yet, and we've got a lot more work to do, and we need to make sure that we've got real partnership. No one, uh, this is not a political issue. Okay. This is not a partisan issue. The enemy is the virus. Right. Well, look, I, I, you'd expect me to say this, I know, because I think you're such a good governor, but I think you've done a one hell of a job. One of the things I hope and maybe we can talk about this later when we come out of this. I hope we can deal with some of the institutional inequities that exist because, you know, we're one of the few nations that every major crisis we've faced in our history has been in a situation where we have uh, come out stronger, come out stronger. And uh, what I'm finding, and maybe we can go back to this later, but uh, I'm finding that, you know, uh, this whole crisis sort of taking the blinders off of most people, you know, the people who weren't necessarily prejudiced, but just didn't focus. That's the geese you hear in the background. <laughs> the, the, the little pond out here. And those Canadian geese are, 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 are trying to get away from the virus. Anyway, all kidding aside, what happens is that uh, 
Um, what I'm finding people who are constantly calling me, and I know we're all in place, but we have a, on the phone probably six hours a day, or people are talking about how they didn't realize that it was somebody making, you know, seven bucks an hour is making, had their back and made sure they still had food. Didn't make that, that person driving that delivery truck, the postman, the person who in fact is the first responder who is with the local fire department. And, you know, these are the people who are, a lot of them are the hourly workers who in fact uh, can't stay home. They, they, you know, they, they can't stay home. They, they can't, and, 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 they're, and they're the ones risking their lives and they're the ones not losing their lives. But, but my point is, I think what you've set up is important because when I was talking to your mayor in Detroit, who's an old friend, I spent a lot of time in Detroit trying to get it back on his feet, as you recall, is that, uh, you know, realizing the disparity and how this virus is affecting minority communities and we started arguing, I think all of you did, that we should be keeping very detailed records about how and who and where and when the virus is striking. But I think uh, there's a lot more to talk about in that. I'm sorry to go off on that. Look, Gov, uh, Governor Lamont and Murphy, I know that both of you are grappling with the same challenges. Uh, uh, what are you seeing in your states? What, you know, uh, um, what's... He, he, whomever, what are the things that people are most concerned about? What, what are you hearing the most? I mean, what's, what's, what, and what keeps you awake at night? You know, I mean, uh, I, I, I'd be interested to hear what you put at the top of the list, if you can. Ned, do you want to jump in? Sure. I'll jump in. Let me just say, um, Hey, Gretchen, it's great to see you. And Phil, I've been so proud of the governors on both sides of the aisle taking the lead on this. And Mr. Vice President, uh, thank you for listening to the governors because we have been on the front line. Uh, something you said and Gretchen said that really resonated with me. You want to know what we've learned. Um, you know, we, we raised the minimum wage here about a year and a half ago, and people were sort of dismissively talking about minimum wage or low wage earners. And as you just said, and as Gretchen said, um, look, our first responders, they can't stay safe, stay at home. We've been asking them every day to go in and keep us safe. And these are, they've gone from being minimum wage workers. I think post COVID, we now call them essential workers, don't we? That's right. I like to think you've understood um, your whole life, it's in your core, Mr. Vice President, that um, work is a lot more than a paycheck. It's about dignity. And now we realize that that food service worker is actually a key part of the, the food supply chain and keeping us healthy. You mentioned uh, the importance of the delivery trucks. You know, how about the janitor? Now we realize when they keep your office clean, they are keeping right. you safe. These are vital pieces of what we uh, try and do. And if we learn anything from this miserable COVID virus, I hope we learn a new respect for a lot of the folks who are doing the work in this country. Phil? Yeah, listen, um, first of all, my late mother would say, as you're known by the company you keep, uh, what company I'm keeping today, Mr. Vice President, beginning with you well, and your thank you. Geese, and with uh, Gretchen and Ned, who are extraordinary governors, uh, who I look up to and look to uh, so often. Uh, and I'm thrilled to be with you, and I'm thrilled to be with great passion and conviction, uh, uh, a, a supporter of yours for President of the United States. So I'm thrilled. Well, uh, to, to be may with get you in trouble. So why? Yeah, yeah, I know, I know, I know. That's okay. I'm channeling the spirit of our late friend Frank Lautenberg. Yeah, from your, I'm, I'm your neighbor to the north, as you know. I was talking uh, to Bob the other day. Oh, is that right? Yeah. God bless her. I bless him. Listen, we remain in the thick of Mr. Vice President. I know you know that. If you yeah. look particularly at uh, per 100,000 residents, so per capita. New Jersey, Connecticut, and New York continue to be, sadly, in the poll positions on positive tests, hospitalizations, and fatalities. Now, the good news is it's gotten better. There's no question about that. Uh, but it is still a reality that we're the densest region in the country, and, uh, and the density of the impact of this virus is unmistakable. Um, so what do, what do we worry about? What do we and what keeps me up, at least uh, right now, it's balancing that progress and that thirst to take steps to reopen 
with the stark reality that this virus is still among us. We had almost 200 people go into the hospital yesterday uh, with COVID-19. Um, we announced 244 fatalities today. And yet again, the, the, the curves that we look at that give us confidence that we can begin to take steps are going in the right direction. So getting that balance right. So we opened up uh, county and state parks uh, a week and a half ago. So far, so good. I just announced today, and you know that you are, your reputation is here still, the, our third senator uh, from the good old days. You know the Jersey Shore as well as I do. Yeah. Uh, we made an announcement today under certain restrictions on density and social distancing, distancing would open our beaches for Memorial Day. And we do that, you know, hopefully, responsibly, uh, and, and our sort of mantras are that public health creates economic health, not the other way around. Uh, and secondly, the data determines dates. As you said this right up front, if, if you look at the science, the data, the hard facts, it tends to get you into the right place, not with public uh, discourse being. So getting that balance right, I would say, keeps us up most at night. And I would say, if you if you gave me two, I would say the other one is the federal government's direct cash assistance to states. Uh, our costs are going up by the minute. Our revenues have fallen off a cliff. I suspect that Gretchen and Ned would be in violent agreement uh, with both of those statements. There's no, you know this better than anybody in the country. There's, no, there's nothing that can replace the existential role that the federal government can play. Uh, we need that direct cash and that will allow us to keep firefighters, police, educators, healthcare workers, EMS on the payroll serving the communities at the time when we need it the very most. You know, I say to all three of you, I think what most informed voters even, I mean, it's not like you're, they have to be uninformed. I don't think people realize that the only branch of the government that is able and necessarily has to be able to engage in deficit spending to deal with crises is the federal government. You all have to balance your budgets. You are required to, at the end of uh, every, every every fiscal, uh, uh, every time you submit a budget, it has to be in balance. And the loss of revenue has been astounding as a consequence of this virus. And you got a you got a real problem. I remember back in uh, in the crisis of uh, uh, 2009, the, the 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 economic crisis, the financial crisis we had. The president asked me to take over a program where there was a, a $800 billion, $800 billion of, of aid that was going to go to state and local governments. Not, not, just, not just that, but to, re, to resurrect the economy, to get it back working, to actually begin to rebuild it. And one of the things that I learned right off the bat was, had we not provided for tens of hundreds of billions of dollars, you're in New Jersey, as well as Michigan and Connecticut, all across the nation. The number of firefighters you'd have to lay off, the number of teachers you'd have to lay off, the number of police officers you'd have to lay off, the number of essential workers you'd have to lay off is staggering. And so I, I, I know uh, the majority leader fairly well, um, Mitch McConnell, and I find it a little disturbing him talking about, well, just declare bankruptcy is yeah. his response. You know, declare bankruptcy. Well, and he's not going to bail out. Uh, why are we bailing out the states? Because guess what? The very people you want to be able to make sure state and local governments will be able to continue to be able to pay and keep on the payroll are the people who are carrying the rest of the country on their back right now. And so I, I find it, I, I just don't, I, I don't understand what they're doing, what he and the president are thinking about. But I, you notice that that the majority, uh, that the Speaker of the House and the minority leader in the Senate have proposed a significant uh, uh, amount of money, about $850 billion for state and local aid. And I think it's necessary. We got to get it out there now. And, uh, but can I ask you all one more question about this and we'll move on. But what about the notion that how prepared do you think we are if God forbid some of the recommendations that are coming from some scientists that we may see a significant rebound in the fall of this virus. Do you think you have enough stockpile PPE, uh, enough testing equipment, enough 
uh, be able to test and trace. I mean, talk to me about what your concerns are about access to the very things that you get the front get that you're going to be, God forbid, if this gets as bad as we're predicting in the fall and going into the winter. Do you feel like you are in a position to be able to not have to go through the same God-awful circumstances you went through the last eight weeks? So maybe I'll start if that's all right. I think, sure. um, you know, what we know is that until there's a vaccine or a cure, the best tool that we have, aside from distancing, which we can't do forever, um, is testing. And we should be testing 1% to 2% of our population every single week. It's about 100 to 200,000 people here in Michigan every single week. We have the capabilities to continue up testing. Uh, we're able to uh, execute the testing at the trace capabilities to follow up where we've got positives. But what we don't have are some of the critical, simple supplies, uh, swabs, which is really not a hard thing to manufacture. We're predominantly produced in Italy, which of course was shut down for a long period of time. And each of these types of COVID tests use a different type of swab. And it's not just a, you can't just use a Q-tip. It has to be, you know, a, a certain type of swab. Um, and so we've gotten some shipments of swabs from the federal government and we are grateful. And they have committed to giving us a weekly shipment. However, we were supposed to have a variety of different types of swabs in this most recent shipment because we've got a variety of different types of tests and they require different implements. We got 100% foam swabs. Now we're grateful for the swabs and I don't, I'm not saying but that test kits that use a different type of swab, we can't use. And so we're not going down one to 2% because we're missing something as simple as a variety of swabs. And, and I share that with you because I think that there's a, a back and forth in the media about whether or not these things exist. They exist, but we need the right um, representation of them in order to fulfill our testing capabilities. That is the key to opening, re-engaging sectors of our economy with confidence. We know where COVID-19 is, that we're able to get it down and keep it from having community spread. And without those things, it's really, um, you know, not wise to go too far out there if you're not able to go all the way. And I think that's one of the things that I know I've talked to J.B. Pritzker from Illinois. He's confronting the same thing. And yeah. we have a regional conversation regularly. I don't know if Phil and Ned have the same experience, but I think that that's one of the frustrations. One of my concerns about it, in this room, we're seeing people in the country, is with us testing, um, we're, we're not doing it right. Gretchen's got it exactly right. Look, it was, uh, it took the federal government, it took the White House to be blunt, a long time to take this seriously. And we were out there on our own. And, uh, but I were neighbors here. Uh, it was like a uh, surge pricing on price. <laughs> they had the uh, PPE, it was coming in from China, ready to go get that Uber car, bing, off goes the plane again. Uh, you know, Phil and I and five other governors, we've gotten together, we're going to purchase as part of a cooperative. Like Gretchen said, you know, like the Christmas trees are arriving on December 26th. This is going to go on for a while. We're going to make sure we have a stockpile in place uh, that we need it for this fall if it comes about. And um, I got to tell you, though, I, I do resent the idea of uh, bailout. Uh, I heard the phrase mentioned. I mean, it was the federal government that stood there and said, it's time for you to slow down significant parts of your economy. We slowed them down. And 90% uh, of our budget shortfall is related to law of revenues that disappeared, not ending to revenue that disappeared. And right now, I can see like an unfunded mandate government. I think they have to step up. And if you ever want to get this economy going again, you don't want the states to be a lodestone in the economy. So I hope Congress does the right thing over the next few weeks. Well, the House did. Phil, do you have any comment on it? Yeah, I'll just briefly add a uh, point of general counsel. He and Andrew Cole were morning, noon, and night as we closed our states, and we determined, you know, it would be smart if we formalized it a few more neighbors. So I just that we announced we're opening beaches today. Importantly, we did that in coordination with Delaware, New York, and Connecticut uh, as uh, of something that's really, that has really worked. It's no secret that as a nation, and certainly in our state, we did not begin a pandemic with remotely the horsepower and the supplies that we needed. Uh, 
grateful that we were able to find on the ground uh, with the federal administration on uh, testing and ventilators and PPE and bed capacity. Gretchen, Gretchen's point is a very good one. Uh, the state of New Jersey, I just announced today, has distributed uh, so far four two and a half million pieces of PPE. I might add a business line that we weren't in two and a half months ago to give to give folks an idea of the volume of stuff that we're talking about here. Your question is, Mr. Vice President, are we prepared for a re rebound in the fall or winter? I would say we're trying to get there. Uh, we are literally, we, we, have, we had a team meeting on that uh, literally today uh, in, in terms of restocking bed capacity, PEs, ventilators, the, the volunteer healthcare worker core that raised their hand to come in and help. We're not there yet, though. Without question, we're not there yet. And please, God, we all have to go through this once uh, that we that we get there and we get there preemptively. Well, Gretchen, as you said, you know, we're not going to be out of this until we have a vaccine. Um, and, uh, and I'm not, and I, I have a, I have a, uh, like all of you, but every day I have between an hour and an hour and a half of a brief with um, uh, the former head of the, our former Surgeon General, anyway, with docs across the country, and they brief me on what they're anticipating, what they're seeing, what they're worried about, and what needs to be done. And uh, testing and tracing are a gigantic part of the answer in the meantime. Um, and uh, we've been kind of I say it's an exaggeration to say a little slow off of the mark. We've been way, way, way off the mark in getting that material to you all. But, you know, one of the things that, that I, I think is important we figure out is, have you guys, have you been thinking about, or is there any way in which, and it should be a federal way in which we do this, but talking about hiring this, this, this uh, um, basically a public health corps, that can be part of the tracing um, and uh, as we move forward. So we can determine who has, where the virus was contracted, how to follow it through, find those people early on, et cetera. That's the first part of the question. The second question I have, and I'm sorry to keep it so long, but you guys are right there. You know what's going on. The second part of the question is, the world got together and decided that they were calling international conference on seeking a vaccine. And we concluded, the president concluded he didn't want to participate because we're the best in the world. He didn't want to participate. And so you have uh, what's going on in <coughs> London, all across the world now. Uh, what I'm a little concerned about is if and when we get a vaccine, we're going to need literally of uh, uh, billions of, of, of those shots. We're going to need to be able to have it available both here in the United States, rural, as well as suburban, as well as inner city. But we're also going to need it internationally. Um, and uh, so I, I, I've, I've thought we have great scientists. I think we have the best in the world. We are working hell on it here. But one of the things we're calling for is a significant increase in funding for the ability to produce the vaccine here in the United States, if in fact one is found. Um, and so have you, have you, when you all talk together, do you talk about testing and tracing or, I mean, wh what are the things you most are concerned about in that area? That, so we don't get back into a, you know, a burst of concern in the fall. I want to control the supply chain myself. I don't want to be sitting around waiting for the national stockpile to decide they can send it to me or waiting for that plane to land from China any longer. You know, working with Phil, working with our, our regional governors here, Gretchen, I assume you're doing the same. We want to get as much of the stockpile we can control ourselves. One state makes the vents. Somebody else is really focusing on pharma. Phil's state is amazing there. Uh, Gina Raimondo up in Rhode Island making masks. I want to make sure next time around, we control our own destiny. Well, I uh, you know one of the things I think you all did and I called for really early on was the need basically for a supply officer. If this were a military operation, you have if we're going to war, you have to know where every every weapon, every tank, every missile, every plane is at, and there's a supply officer. You go to where the need is the greatest, the troops that need the most help. And uh, 
Uh, the best of my knowledge, that doesn't exist right now. Is there one place you can call uh, to, to get an answer to what is available or not available for you? Or do you go to multiple places and within the federal government, if at all? It's for, at least for us, it's been the FEMA administrator more often than not, yeah. uh, who's a Northeast guy, by the way. I think we're an island yeah. native. Uh, I want to come back, Mr. Vice President, to, to the point you made, the sort of public health army. Uh, we're standing up our testing and contact tracing, and Gretchen said it. That's exactly in terms of the percentage of our population. We think we've got to test every week. So we've said we're going to be at at least 20,000 tests a day by the end of this month, 5,000 by the end of June. But we also said contact tracing is a big piece of this. So we we started with Rutgers School of Public Health, which is going to contribute several hundred folks. And this is on top of the county folks who are already doing a really good job at this. But we then said, listen, if you want to sign up uh, to be a contact tracer, go to our, our main covid19.nj.gov website and, and backslash tracing and, and, and give us your name. So we, we, I made that announcement at a conference at Tuesday, Tuesday at one o'clock of this week. Uh, the next day, someone asked me, same press conference, same time, how many had signed up? And my colleague told me that in 24 hours, over 21,000 people had signed up <laughs> to want to do this, which tells you two things. The spirit of service, not just in our state, but certainly here and around the country. And two, the amount of people who are desperately looking for a job right That's now. That's exactly right. Not be overestimated. That's exactly right. Well... In order uh, for you all to effectively carry out your reopening plans uh, to get the economy back on track to support workers and their families and communities, uh, you need the resources. And, uh, and I know that the rising cost imposed by the pandemic, declining tax revenues have hit you really, really hard. And, uh, and uh, I, uh, like I said, uh, uh, the House has stepped up and said we should be providing state and local funding so you don't have to make the painful cuts. And uh, um, this isn't some math exercise. It's about people. It's about making sure you don't have to cut firefighters, teachers, police officers, critical public health programs, and uh, or stop work on roads and bridges. Look, we included the Recovery Act in 2009, uh, it being critical to keep all these folks in place. Are you, what are you hearing from your mayors and your county executives about the budget cuts that they're having to make. I assume they're coming to the state asking for help. Um, uh, are, and uh, the budget cuts that uh, uh, they're worried about if uh, Trump and McConnell continue to, uh, to block this funding. What are, what are the local officials coming to you asking for? What, what, what kind of shape are they in? They're in tough shape. This has already started. That's the other thing is we talk too often, I'm guilty of this myself, that this is a potential or, or possible eventuality, uh, which, which runs the risk of this being abstract. We've got right now municipalities laying off far, uh, firefighters uh, in New Jersey. Uh, this is upon us. And the numbers are significant. You know, our numbers are deep dub, dub, double digit billions of dollars that we think we need. Uh, and you know, I, if we don't get it, I think Mr. Vice President, our folks think it's up to one third at the state level, up to one third of our workforce, which is 200,000 more people, not just who would be out of their jobs, but they are overwhelmingly the, overwhelmingly the people at the point of attack right now, dealing with the residents who That's most right. need them, health, right. health related, unemployment claims filers, et cetera. So it's real and it's right it, and it's upon us. Well, it's the essential workforce that is still working. I mean, if you look at our budgets, we're anticipating about a $3 billion shortfall in the current fiscal year. It'll be bigger than that in the next fiscal year. And the places, of course, the biggest parts of our budgets are public health, public safety, and public education, all of which are absolutely critical in a global pandemic where we are confronting you know, this crisis. We've got to protect public health. We've got to protect public safety. And the education of our kids is already been so compromised. We think the usual learning loss of a summer is tough. We're going to have real needs to wrap our kids around with the sports so that they can be, you know, not lose all this time of, of education where they're not in the classroom getting it. And so um, we do. And I think, you know, to, to Phil's point, 
as a as a group of governors, this is front and center for every single one of us, Democratic and Republican. And we are at the NGA trying to get Congress to take action. We're grateful for what the House leadership did, uh, but what's going to happen in the Senate and where the White House is, I think, is is the great unknown. And that's why it's got to be all hands on deck because these states are full of good people who just simply want government to work and are desperately relying on these fundamentals that are at risk here if we don't get this assistance quickly. If I could just add, Mr. Vice President, what makes the education particularly tough is A, the risk that you're going to have to cut it by 20%. At the same time, we're probably going to have to shrink the size of our classes so that there's some type of social distancing there. We're going to have to maybe stagger schedules a little bit. Like Gretchen said, this is all coming on the heels of kids who have been had their inter- education to some degree interrupted. If you can give us a little bit of certainty in terms of what we can plan for and budget for, that'll make a world of difference for the future of these kids in our states. Well, I think it's a it's a gigantic deal. And what I've been interested to see is the, you know, uh, governors that I used to work with in the Senate, like the governor of Ohio and others. A lot of governors are speaking up, Republican governors. And saying, hey, Mr. President, we need the help. We need the help. It makes sense. And uh, as I said, what I'm, here's what I'm hopeful of. And maybe I'm just, as uh, one of my doctors said years ago when I was hospitalized with an aneurysm, they said, my problem is I'm a congenital optimist. Uh, <laughs> but, uh, but I think I am. I, I think that what's happening is all of this is sort of being stripped bare and people are beginning to see and understand how things work and how they don't work and why it's time to step up. And uh, for example, uh, you know, once we get, if we get by the virus, I think it's a false choice to say we either deal with employment or we deal with the virus. You can't, you can't separate them. You know, unless you get the virus under control, unemployment and the economy is going to remain in real trouble. And so one of the things that I think is important is as we get from stimulus, what we're talking about now, into recovery, uh, we have an opportunity to really uh, provide for some real changes, economic change. For example, one of the things that we're finding out all across the country, I've been pushing a thing, it's not about me, but I've been pushing a thing for dealing with $20 billion for nationwide broadband, uh, and in, particularly in rural areas. I worked a lot in your state, Gov, uh, 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 Gretchen, about dealing with this because in the peninsula, you got a lot of problems. And, and so we're all of a sudden, we're finding out these parents from families that are, are, are not used to uh, having to be concerned about their kids being able to get their education. Now that they're, they're home and they're supposed to be taking, whether it's college, graduate school, undergraduate school, high school, grade school, they're finding they can't get online. They can't, they can't follow the teachers. They can't do the classes. And so I, I, I think, I, don't, I hope I'm not kidding myself. I think we're going to be able to see some genuine, genuine recovery and creating as if we deal with these issues. We, I think we can create 10 million good paying jobs just by dealing with infrastructure, the environment, and a whole range of things that become clear to us that can be dealt with and employ people in a way that, in fact, is going to make us stronger rather than weaker. But uh, I'm keeping you a long time. I'm sorry. I'm taking advantage of you. Is there anything any one of you would like to talk about before we close out? I know I've kept you a long time. I'd like to talk about the fact we need a congenital optimist in the White House, Mr. (laughs) Vice (laughs) President. But we've learned a lot from this COVID, and uh, we ought to start thinking about um, what we've learned that uh, we can turn the quarter on. Uh, You you mentioned um, the digital divide and the IT. Look, it's all been telehealth and telecommuting. Exactly. So Brown v. Board of Education is if you can't get access to the Internet and can't get access to online learning, you lose. We've got to expand that. I hope to God healthcare has learned what telehealth is, and we can uh, build off of that. I hope we've learned a lot about nursing homes, Mr. Vice President, because uh, yep. that's what we're going to recast in a big way. We need somebody who can think big in the White House. Well, and I hope we've learned a lot about racial disparities and the agenda for America that really creates opportunity and equity. I hope that we have learned to embrace science. And hey, let's translate this into some good work to combat climate change. I mean, 
I, I'm hopeful that in the in all of this grim reality that we're all doing our best to get through and, and to, on behalf of our people, that we take with this some lessons learned that we can be, make a, a stronger uh, United States where there is opportunity and that we are leaders on these fronts because um, that, that is, that's where there is um, a real potential for something positive to come out of this. I would just echo uh, and say I endorse everything that Ned and Gretchen have just said, in particular, uh, what it would be like to have you in the White House, Mr. Vice President. Uh, we need wow. that optimism. We need a plan. We need to make decisions based on data and science. We need to close the inequities Gretchen talked about. Every day I speak to some loved ones of uh, families who have lost someone to this. I just literally got off the phone just before uh, you and Annie called me, Mr. Vice President, with Mrs. Clegg, whose son, Michael, African-American, Newark cop, died COVID-19, a healthy guy, 27 years uh, on the service. Again, a, a proud African-American community, a guy who was laying it out every day. We've got, we cannot afford as a nation to learn these lessons uh, again, we've got to learn them now and take the steps we need to close those inequities. I uh, could not agree more, and I'm, I'm incredibly honored to be on this conversation with each of you. Well, thanks. Good luck, folks. Uh, you know, uh, those 85,000 people who've died, they're, they're not a number. They, they left behind entire families and communities. And uh, we all know from our own personal experiences that it's awful hard to overcome the loss of a son, daughter, mother, father, husband, wife, you know, mom, dad. I mean, it's uh, um, and uh, it's, it's it takes it takes a long, a long time. The only thing I can tell those folks who have had those losses is that um, they're they're going to stay with you. They're in your heart. They're not going to go away. They're part of you. And I, the way I've focused on it is the way you can deal with it is have a purpose. And the purpose is changing the circumstances that created this circumstance in the first place. And I think there's an awful lot of people who are willing to do that. You see all those kids out of medical school signing up, all those nurses who are showing up. I mean, you see, I mean, it's amazing. It's amazing. You know, I drive you guys crazy over the last year about talking about, you know, we have to restore the soul of America. We're seeing the soul of America. Yeah. Soul of America is all those people who are just going out and literally many of them risking and losing their lives to carry the rest of us on their back. Look, I, I know you all need to get back to governing, so let me close by thanking again for your work and always being available if I pick up the phone and call and ask for your, your, your input. And uh, you've been exemplary leaders in a time of crisis for real. I'm not just saying it. You know, I know I speak for all of us when I say, Thank you, thank you for all of the frontline workers you're backing up, for all the people you're, you're, that are keeping our community running and during this crisis and, and are risking, as we've just pointed out, all of us, their personal health and safety in the process. The real American heroes, the real American heroes are the doctors, the nurses, healthcare workers, EMTs, firefighters, police. If I can, as they used to say in the Senate, a point of personal privilege, uh, a family member who has ha had a, 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 a problem uh, out on the West Coast, uh, um, you know, found themselves uh, uh, in an emergency and, and, the, and, and these EMT guys and firefighters showing up and being there to take care of her. She's fine now. But the point is they, they show up. They, they don't ask, uh, you know, by the way, uh, where you're from, how much money do you have, what's your color, what's your religion, what's your background? You know, they just don't do it. And, you know, grocery store workers, clerks, meat packers, farm workers, you know, delivery drivers, the mass transit workers, all those folks, all too often the lowest paid, the least appreciated members of society. But in this crisis, they're showing us what is essential. And it's making it clear about, about who is invaluable in our nation. I think it's time we reward these people and actually make this country work better again. So I want to thank you all for taking the time, sharing your insights. I know you are really on the line every single minute. You know, we've talked today about a lot of difficult issues, but I know that uh, we're going to get through this together because seeing the American character, the very soul of this country on display every day, 
we know, we know there's not a single thing we can't accomplish when we stand together as one nation, united in purpose, taking care of our neighbors, committed to getting the job done. That's what we've seen, seen us through every crisis in the past. And I think it's going to see us through again, and no small part because of your leadership. So I wish you well of my mom. We're here. She'd look at you all. And, and Phil, we always quote our mom. She'd say, God bless you, dear. God bless you for what you're doing. I really mean it. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. We need you badly. You're doing an incredible job. Thanks for taking the time. See you in Connecticut, Mr. Vice President. All right. God willing. See you in Thanks, Michigan. Mr. Vice President. Take care. <laughs> You'll see me more than you want me once this is... <laughs> As, as you've all pointed out in the past, I'm usually the first one to show up and the last one to go home. <laughs> I'm, I'm like the poor relative. But anyway, thank you all very, very much. Thank you. Thank you, you. Thank you sir. See you guys. See you, Bye. Nancy, Gretchen.